So we'll let the discussion flow then and we'll start with some questions. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of points, trading questions, kind of under the title of benchmarking. Uh, in terms of why housing associations are doing this, one of the questions I think, as Terry alluded to, it's kind of social housing is a little bit under the cost and has to produce the evidence, and that's one of the reasons that why we're all doing it. I just wanted to ask, um, for me one of the key questions is benchmarking between outcomes of people in social housing compared to outcomes of people in local authority housing or in private housing, in terms of the sector, just the balance of the like in the political environment. Although we're at early stages, I think the survey is a really good um, step in that. This has work gone on to look at the outcomes of um, households that are in the private sector compared to social housing, where they're, they're having all these added value services. There is, there is desk research into that. Um, I think it was Burr that produced a report that you're more likely to have health, uh, poor health outcomes if you live in for longer time in, in private sector housing <coughs> compared to social housing. So there is quite a bit of desk research out there. We've used some of that in our comprehensive spending review submissions as well. Um, I've got quite a bit of that stuff back at the office. If anybody's interested in some sources, around different outcomes, um, you know, I, I can get, get some sources for you, but it is, there isn't that much study. The main thing is just the cost of undertaking a comparative study. Um, but there are some, you just have to look around to get that evidence, but this may not be as structured as you would like it. There are some, there are some evidence bases around that sort of thing. When I've sort of read um, criticism of social housing has been, well, people live in social housing states and they don't have jobs, there's um, all these issues that you get in any estate, but I think that's a really good point because all, all the stuff, I mean, if you just read over to the riots and to, you know, social housing tenants, so everyone's are being evicted, no private tenants are being evicted. It, I think the problem is going to be who takes the lead on it because the Fed's doing it on behalf of housing associations. Um, Got, I would have thought it's got to be government that thing and how they raise their interest in it and then how they focus on it. It's actually that's where the question you need to come from. So this has got to be a, a starting point. But I think it's a really good point about how you take it forward and how you use it. I was going to take a slightly opposite track. To so some extent, it'd be blurred. I mean, we're a stock transfer association in Bradford and we have large states with lots of different tenure. And we tend not, when we're doing interventions, just to focus on our, our tenants, it's a community so our intervention would benefit more all tenures, so it would be difficult to, to isolate the impact on, on different tenures. I think that's right, and so do we, but uh, we've got dispersed stock as well as, as state-based stock, and, and, we, and we take a community-based approach, a neighbourhood-based approach. I think it's something about private housing, and uh, as we said, you know, it's not comparison, because in a way that's a control group, or it could be a control well, we have lots of private extract devices on yeah. the state, so even that's difficult. There are ethical issues about having a control group in terms of social <laughs> interventions. <laughs> so, no, abandon those. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it seems to me that, that this, these are quite important issues, though, because it's, as you say, defining who benefits mm. and mm. what would have happened if there hadn't been these interventions. So, uh, so that's some, something for you to think about, isn't it, in terms of comparative information and the idea of control. I'm not sure the ethical issues are that great because, you know, it's more a question of identifying people who haven't participated or benefited in certain interventions. But I don't think any of us are offering universal interventions. So, but anyway, some other points. Uh, I think for me the two distinctions between the two presentations were quite stark. One was about impact and the other one's very much about measurement and, and analysis. I suppose this is a question for you as much as uh, rather than Vanessa Terry. Um, the work that you're doing is very much about measuring outputs in what we do. Do you think the NHS will ever get in a position where they can start to measure on behalf of its members the outcomes that those outputs produce? And in effect asks the so what question. Yeah. The government presumably could turn around with that, that report and say, all right, housing associations do all of this, but so what? Which is the same question that we asked ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, 
if I say something first on that, in terms of outcomes, um, there are some certain synergies that we're working hopefully towards. Um, there's the Community Impact Tracker Toolkit, which um, is marketed by Housemark. They're actually, our, our survey is really aligned to that. It uses the same categories. Um, as far as inputs and outputs, they match. Obviously, they go the next step to look at impact. Um, so if you look at the, uh, sort of hopefully the direction of travel, once enough people start using a common toolkit um, across the sector, we can then start looking at impact. To try and measure impact at um, a sector-wide level in terms of these activities, I just don't think it's possible. You can look at it, say, I know the Welsh Housing Federation are looking at the economic impact, the Northern Ireland um, uh, housing associations have also done a similar survey as well. Uh, that's mostly a desk-based research uh, project. So I think the Federation could do something like that. And I, I mean, there is the, the input-output data tables in terms of economic impact, and we've mentioned some of that again in our comprehensive spending review submissions, um, the impact of social housing in terms of economics. And, and well, obviously we touched on the social impact, but to try and measure impact of these types of activities is possible organisationally, but I just don't think it would be possible at a sector-wide level. But I wish it was because it would be incredible evidence. And that's that's, my not, that's anyway. because there's more consistency around the outcomes that people actually got. I think then I'd hand over to Vanessa at I this think, point. I think this, this was something that was brought up in the, the last session we had um, um, with regards to this as well. And, and part of the problem in actually measuring that impact and moving from the outcomes to the impact is actually the value that you then ascribe to that. So if you're preventing someone becoming pregnant or homeless or whatever, what, what value do you put on that? And I know there's been some work that was mentioned last time that housing associations getting together and trying to agree on a common measure. And I think due to the sort of diversity of people you're dealing with, location, etc., etc., it's you know that's a really, really difficult task. And I think that, alongside that, sort of you know, as as organisations yourself, you're only really starting off on the on the path to measurement. It's it's something that it's that silver bullet, isn't it? Down the down the line, it'd be fantastic. But I think there's a lot of a lot of thinking sort of before that. And I think there's also um, referring. I don't want to get theoretical here, but we're referring to the literature. There's a lot of there's quite a lot of literature coming out now about contingency frameworks and actually why you should measure something and what you shouldn't measure. And actually coming to the conclusion that you can't measure everything and you really you really need to start looking at individual elements and thinking, okay, to what extent can we attribute cause and effect to this and come to some bold decisions as to actually we can't measure everything just because we're being told to, but then actually align that with Let's not just take the easy way out and measure things that are easy. So there's a lot of difficult decisions, I think, along the way, which probably doesn't answer your question. But, uh, but I think we're. I, think no, we're I assume the answer would be no. Yeah. That's a long way of saying, isn't it? Was that a trick question? <laughs> Can I just ask, with, with, with your audience, Terry, sure. um, because we were asked not to count anything that was done with supporting people. Yes, yes. And I'm just thinking from Vanessa's point there, and I can think one project that we've just run, we have some mother and baby units, which sure. are teenage, teenage mothers, and we did a project around sexual relationships and, and uh, sexual health. And for the first time ever, we've had no repeat pregnancies, so we can really show an impact there. But that was actually all supporting people. Most of our supported housing stuff is done through supporting people. So we simply have not included that in the audience. And that's sort of missed as a sector. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with that really strongly. Sure. I mean, we looked at uh, all of our sports and we've got floating sports and as well. But it's, it's SP funded and it just took out the whole swathe of information. Um, that was a decision made, um, made by the top. Um, in terms of what we're trying to do is, uh, and, I, and I can understand your views on that. What we're trying to do was look at the impact of non-regulated activities, and our view was that they are regulated. Um, they fall under that sort of description. There is things like the Cat Gemini report that measures the impact, of, and that's you talked an example of that. The Cat Gemini report is really good at measuring the financial benefits of um, supporting people type activities. So we felt there is an evidence base there about that. Um, 
but it, it, I, um, within within the, the federation itself, there was a debate: should we include it? And obviously, our supporting people um, team were really keen to include it, but that got overruled. Um, but what I can say is, because you're using the toolkit, what perhaps you might want to do is, you at an organisational level, record it. So when you present the information to your stakeholders, that toolkit can be for us the bits that we need, but you can use that toolkit to include whatever you want, whatever you're using your definitions, and that can include supporting housing people. Then you've got a real complete evidence base that you can share with your tenants, your stakeholders, and if you've got impact information to go on top of that, even better. So I think ours is a starting base, and it's and it comes from the organisational politics and the rest of it, um, you know, in terms of what the audit's about. But there's no reason why you can't go further and include that within your audit document for your own uses. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, thank you. Can I just add to that in terms of um, how we're talking about the, the outcomes from the housing and the, the added value and support sure. that other organisations like myself would work directly in the community. For example, how it would work within our partnership with Compton Symphony Housing is, you know, they're a great provider of support to the housing and the infrastructure of the communities. Our project is the infrastructure within the communities and supporting the development of the families and the transition back into community. However, that for me, I need to, or we don't need to, where we work as a partnership, we then feed their social outcomes to our housing provider. Obviously, to evidence the work that we're doing in their communities, but as added value for when we're doing joint strategic funding, etc. And how it's been evidenced over the last two years, particularly the estates that we work have massive critical needs when it comes to uh, losing money. Um, it's, it's just about to be showcased where how the government are looking at what estates caused riots and what didn't, and what was done in them to prevent them to the estates that did have any social leaders in them and did riot. And this is an initiative, like this lady said here, where the government are now taking a lead on talking to social leaders and getting that added support that we offer in partnership with the housing provider as a preventative model for future riots, etc. Um, but I just wanted to talk about it. It's really important that the, the social outcomes are as important from within the community as well as from the housing provider. And on that point, we're actually working on the report about the riots. If I can get your details, um, I know they're looking for case studies and information. So again, if anybody else has got or been touched by riots in, in, in any of their neighbourhoods and are doing work around that. We are collecting evidence and if I can get your cards and information, I'll pass those on to the relevant people internally and hope we can showcase the stuff you're doing, again, about the support and working with your neighbourhoods. Um, actually, I'll finish up. This is my point, but just about the riot report, actually. Sure. Um, I'm from Bromden, I'm sorry for being late, but I got caught up in the Marks and Spencer side, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> I did get lost in there, but not in there. Um, so I'm from Bromford, and I'll thank you for and everybody who's working for the years ago, about the, the audit. Um, but in terms of the riot report, actually, we're having a, a tweet off next week um, with our Customer Influence Group at um, 4.30 on Monday afternoon. So if anybody does want to join that debate online, um, we're doing a it's hashtag riot report where we're encouraging customers to give their feedback on their experiences um, and we're leaving that for our customer influence group. So if anybody would like to contribute on Monday, that would be fantastic. Because we do get very excited when, uh, when people in areas of the, of the country do contribute. So it's a good one. Um, and we'll be feeding that into the into the report. Um, you, you know about that? Yes, yeah. we are. So you're um, working with Helen on this? Is it Helen? Helen. Helen Williams, is it? Helen Williams. Okay, uh, wait, well, it's Sue Murray, who's coordinated the Shockwave social media campaign to try and get as many views as we can. Some very interesting views on Facebook and Facebook, but um, we'll feed all those in. And my point, though, is around, um, I think, as a housing provider, about how we are um, really looking to be an, a sector that wants to be invested in by other, um, by other organisations, and particularly I'm thinking around things like the work programme. Um, and conversation you have with people who need on health and social care, how they can see multiple outcomes from our investment into, I'm particularly thinking about supporting people actually, about how we provide service to, um, through supporting people um, into a home and actually we're bringing in other partnerships that can add value to that without them actually spending any more money on us, you know, so it makes that really good value. Um, but I think as a sector it would be really important actually to capture that 
um, so that we become a, a, a sector where people who are um, commissioning the work program think, do you know what, we'll get multiple outcomes if we use a housing provider as a subcontractor to deliver this. And some of those, you know, just about the commercial market in the really.